time after time, his children on him, etc. Uh, they're going too slow, uh, they're a hazard. And one of the things I want to bring up is, number one, I believe Keeper can be in them. Uh, and in the statute, it says any municipality or county in the interest of safety can be in them. So I think both Keeper and the town can be in them if they so choose. There are certain things that are required in the law. The first one is you cannot convert a golf cart to a low speed vehicle. It has to be original equipment from the manufacturer and certified. So anybody who puts lights or directionals or anything on a golf cart does not meet the standards. It does have to be the, uh, meet all the federal standards. They have to be, obviously, they have to be licensed. They have to have insurance. I don't know if the ones people are renting have insurance. I don't think normal automobile insurance necessarily covers that. Uh, they, uh, when you get into the registration certificate, it has to be on board, proof of liability insurance, etc. cetera. Uh, there's a separate statute for golf carts, which I may mention. Uh, the registration card has to be on the vehicle, the driver's license, everybody's got to be 16, it, meets, it has to be all the laws. It has to be registered and licensed in the same fashion as a passenger vehicle pursuant to state law. The standards of what they require, headlamps, front rear turn signals, tail lamps, stop lamps, reflectors on each side, exterior mounted mirror on the driver's side, and another exterior mirror, mirror or one up top. A parking brake, a windshield that conforms with 49 CFR or whatever, I doubt if golf carts read that. A VIN that conforms to the requirement of the state law. A type one and type two seatbelt assembly. Type one is waist, type two is belt. And they have to comply with the rear visibility requirements. South Carolina uh, has some more specific laws. It has to be four wheels, it has to be able to attain a speed of 20 miles an hour, but not more than 25 miles an hour. It can only be operated on a speed limit of 30 miles, 35 miles or less. And uh, it can cross a highway. It can only be operated by a person with a driver's license, which I said it's so. And uh, it's factory equipped with windshield wipers, rear view, inside view mirrors, speed on the turn signals, horn, DOT, headlight, taillights, etc. So it's got like the federal standard and even the state standards even a little uh, more severe. <coughs> South Carolina has one of the most uh, restrictive child seat uh, protection laws. And uh, it's been updated in 2011. There's 12 states that have adopted the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, requirement. Uh, one of the requirements is children two or under has to be in safety seat rear face approved. Uh, and it gets down to seven year olds, five year olds, different requirements. Uh, some of the common uh, comments I've had in all of the emails I've received one, children on the, on the cots in laps. Uh, I saw one, I wrote, wrote some notes that I was coming down by Night Harrow Park. There was, there was a golf cart type, certainly not one manufactured for it, with set six people on it. One was a baby in the mother's lap on the, on the passenger side. They pulled over to let traffic go by, which is another problem because you have to cross the yellow line to get by, and that's another violation. But what happened was once I got, there were about 12 cars behind me, by the time I got to the second gate, they caught up. They went on the bike path, up and over the hump, turned right, and I just, I was in my car, I'll go the same speed as that thing. It was going 22 miles an hour on the bike path with six people there. That's not the first time I saw it. I heard comment after comment after comment. Here. People see them on the bike paths. So I, I think one of the reasons we see this uh, sudden increase in the use of it, the company in Charleston started on May 18th. They're advertising like Craig. They even say it's approved in Keelan, okay? Ironically, they had to send out a memo because they can't use it in the city of Charleston. Because in Charleston, you cannot rent one of those vehicles. Short term, you have to eat, you have to own it. They can't use it in Charleston. So I think that uh, for safety purposes, uh, one of the things that I've noticed, our speed limits, 35 is 40, 30 is 35, 25 is 30, and 20 is 25. So for all intents and purposes, you have construction vehicles, everybody, we have a highway out there between Keeler Island Parkway, Governor's Drive, and out to the ocean course. Traffic in the morning is very busy. It's going 40 miles an hour. It's, nobody ever enforces it at 35 miles an hour. So you've got 18 mile an hour traffic fighting 20 mile an hour. One accident, 
So all it's going to take, we're going to be on the front page of the Post and Courier. If they either t bone somebody or somebody t bones one of them, it's going to be bad. Okay? And I, I'm willing to bet that those young women with their two year olds and one year olds in their lap probably have an SUV with a $500 child safety seat. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know what they're thinking, but I think it's nip it in the bud. Uh, I had a couple of comments from two people on the island that own one, and basically they're saying, oh, we always pull over, and oh, by the way, we don't take big parking spaces. There's no place to park anything except the parking lot. They're going to take the space. Uh, so I, I think that this is something that should be done before more people start buying them and start complaining the advantage. I, I think it's critical. Uh, I've made copies of all, of all of the laws, et cetera, and I'll give to the board. It's all online. Uh, and uh, like I said, they put it right in there. Any municipality or county can ban them if they want. And they just should be banned. <coughs> I mean, I've got over 100 emails saying I agree to get rid of these things. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Gay Statins, 288 Marsh Cove Road. I just want to back up what he said. False advertising by the company who's delivering these things. Not to Kiwa saying they are street legal in Kiwa is flat out wrong, uh, but it attracts people uh, to sign up for these things to be delivered. I've encountered probably 12 of them in the last two months on the bike path in the street. None of them in compliance with the regulations that he just outlined. Seen two or three babies sitting on grandma's lap, on mom's lap, with no belt on the baby. All it's going to take is a deer to run out in front of that golf cart, hit the brakes, and the baby is flying off of the lap of the person in the passenger seat. We don't want that to happen to anybody. I would never let anybody in my family use one of those things, particularly on Kewa Island Parkway, Governor's Drive, and Ocean Course Drive. I ride my bike that route five days a week if it's not raining. The trucks that are coming in to do work here are not obeying the speed limit, particularly coming down Governor's Drive where my street is. You could issue hundreds of speeding tickets and take the revenue to use to repay for the bike pass if you want. Um, but if one of them hits the golf cart, we're going to have debts associated with it. And maybe it's an entertainment thing for people, but you don't need those here. Ride your bike on the bike path, wear a helmet if you're smart, or drive your car or walk. They are absolutely not needed here. This is not the Fusky Island. This is not Baldwin Island. And I think that we need to be proactive about it, and not reactive after a death or a severe head injury. I lost a friend in a situation like this on a golf cart eight years ago at Hilton Head. Young mother and wife got thrown out of the passenger seat. Her head hit the curb, and she was dead two days later. Any other member comments? I forgot one. Um, on the annual meeting ballot procedures, the last paragraph on the front of the page says no motions will be taken from the floor. Is that not in direct contravention to the covenants which describe if you want to submit a motion, how to do that? The motions that are taken at the May at the meeting that aren't submitted by whatever the date is sometime in December. Those motions are just advisory motions that are made at the meeting itself. Um, and the chair has the authority to determine whether or not that motion is going to be held. But if there is a procedure to follow it, if you want to have something on the agenda, but it has to be submitted, and I don't off the top of my head, but it's but there's a date it has to be submitted. Exactly, yeah. It and then typically falls sometime in December if I recall. Because we have to get the materials printed and out, etc. To your first point, we want to make sure people have plenty of time to digest the information. <laughs> Jim, what is resolution G fifteen that's being We'll talk about it. Okay. Well because it's not here. That's why I was asking. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Indy Kilmeck, 718 Glossy Ibis. I brought this up in the past, and I'll probably bring it up until I go to the nursing home. 
But I just want to make a comment about the parking lot at the sanctuary. The summer was incredible. And I know you mentioned that. Pardon me, the sanctuary? Yes, the sanctuary. The sanctuary. I, I mean, I'm sorry. It's the sanctuary. I'm getting more The sand castle. Yes, correct. Yes. Um, and I know there are homeowners that rent cars from the airport, but it's like crazy how many non members, non homeowners are using that parking lot and walking through. I know the boardwalk is not finished yet on the other side, but I mean, the beach club has scanner cards. We could do something like that, I'm sure. So I'm, I'm going to keep bringing this up, whatever. And <laughs> I have a list here from somebody that could not make this meeting. She wanted to be here, so I'm just gonna read it quickly. Um, as we can't attend the meeting, here are some thoughts. Make the age of the adult pool and bar 21 or older. Parents are buying alcoholic drinks for the minor kids all the time. And we are set up for a liquor code violation or worse. Guests constantly take their drinks into the pool, which makes a mess and can't be good for the pool system. Non-members are coming from the beach and buying food and drinks at the bar. They should not be allowed. Parents are bringing their children who are now under, who are under 18 and lying to the attendants about their age and then the attendants have to go back, check the system to determine they are indeed underage. There's no penalty for the dishonesty, so there's no incentive to obey the rules. They need to station someone by the back gate to monitor people coming off the beach to confirm whether they are members. The adult pool is far more credibly anticipated. Monitoring usage is important. Someone needs to be there until the gate is locked at night. Often people would come after hours knowing it wouldn't be monitored. And I've seen this happen a lot. They come off the beach they're, and jump into the pools, whatever. And it's going to take somebody that's going to get hurt, drown, God forbid, if there's no monitoring going on after the attendants leave. And now, at the end of the summer, there's nobody even there to watch the gates. Um, and I know when it first opened, the rules were not enforced because of the craziness, but I think this is also maybe cause, may cause future problems. The people that were here earlier this season may come back next, next year and continue expecting the rules to be lax again. There also needs to be a sign maybe hanging on all the doors of the workout room and exercise classroom so that people don't enter or exit the pool there. Uh, is it possible to put the same pool tags on people who enter the gym? And then in closing, she says, I would like to say how beautiful the San Casa pool is. It turned out, I appreciate the work put into it, but not enforcing the rules is critical for it, properly, for it to be properly maintained and enjoyed by its members. We pay for this privilege, and it needs to be respected by all who use it. Thank you.
the timing is such that she's probably in surgery right now, so our thoughts are with, uh, with her and, and with uh, Mike. Look forward to having him back at our next meeting. Uh, I did want to just um, uh, thank everyone who had a hand in the ribbon cutting at the Sand Castle. Uh, it was, uh, we acknowledged at the event that um, we totally understood that we were having a ribbon cutting for a project that's still under construction. But, um, you know, given the unique nature of our uh, community where we have people who are here for the summer and then leave, and then vice versa, we wanted uh, to be able to have a little toast, a little celebration with those folks that, that might not be here uh, when we have our big event in October, which is going to be the traditional Celebrate Kiowa event that we could not have in March because we were closed. But thanks again um, to everyone who was a part of that. If you weren't able to come, we definitely look forward to seeing you in uh, October. Yesterday at the town council meeting, um, a committee working on sea level rise uh, made their presentation of their report to the town council, and a copy has now been distributed to all of our board members. And uh, is it on the website? Yes. The town has it on their website now. I met with the mayor a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and he indicated that, that what he hoped we would be able to do as a next step is to um, get as many members of our board together with the town council, the ARB, the uh, committee, or some subgroup of the committee, and really dig into this report. Obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty substantial uh, document, and so I expect next few days we'll likely hear from the town and uh, we'll just work on the day that is best for the majority uh, of folks here but uh, a lot of good information in here I do look forward to the opportunity to talk about some of the things that are listed as suggestions which are actually already underway or are well underway uh, from Kiko's perspective and also talk about sort of the shared responsibility amongst the entities for uh, various things that are contained in this report. I also wanted to mention that um, the Keough Island Utility visited us recently and indicated that um, they uh, plan to file for a rate increase on the board rates uh, and I've invited them to come to a future board meeting to share that information and, and, um, and share their, their reasons why they are doing that uh, or proposing that. Our budget process is now well underway at Kiko. We're in a phase where all of our department heads and staff members are putting together the first draft of their departmental level budget recommendations. Our finance committee will start to work on that in early October. It'll go to the finance committee a couple of times before the board considers the budget for 2019 at the November meeting. I do want to make a comment about the low speed vehicles. I did read a number of the emails on the listserv uh, and I saw that David was going to be here uh, to speak on this point. Um, I, I guess my first point is uh, it was just the last meeting I think. I think it was the last board meeting where I raised this issue and said that I think this is something that maybe we should take a look at. I don't have a recommendation. I don't um, have really any feedback at that point. It was limited to one individual who uh, had expressed a lot of concern. But I, and I still think it's an important issue uh, for us to um, study. I have reached out to uh, community managers around the country because what I want to understand is are there unintended consequences just um, uh, coming up with a ban? Uh, are, are there things that we're not thinking about? Interestingly, the, the responses from around the country have primarily been why in the world would you want to ban an environment? 
environmentally friendly vehicle, <laughs> uh, which, you know, we've heard a little bit of that here. The Seabrook, my counterpart at Seabrook has conducted a formal survey of community associations. Again, we don't have to be like everyone else. I'm not suggesting that, but I do think it's useful to understand what other communities are doing. And I think he can easily do a, a flash survey of our membership here. Technology does make it easy to get uh, that kind of feedback. We, we heard the, the um, you know, this flared up yesterday on the listserv. We heard 20 or 30 folks comment on it, but we've certainly seen that uh, there, are, there are times when the intensity of uh, interest in, a, in an issue that's on the site doesn't necessarily represent what everyone is truly thinking. That could totally be the case here, but I, we can very easily do a flash survey. And then I'll give this one high marks for some humor, but also um, I think some practical advice. I got a private email uh, this morning that said, I hate anything that slows me down, but even being here full time, I might see an LSB once a month. My understanding is that they are street legal in South Carolina, so I'm guessing their top speed must be near the Kiowa speed limit. And I've never been held up for more than a quarter mile. I'm almost daily held up for 10 miles by people that drive cars 25 and 35 zones. If you want to draft a new rule, please don't accidentally ban electric cars or hybrids. If the board is going to begin to set agendas based on pet peeves, let me put in my vote for finding a way to ban people that drive their cars below the speed limit. <laughs> um, as I said in the last, I, I think that we need to look at this harder, um, and um, but I, I don't think this board today is prepared to um, to make a rule change today. But I just want to um, reiterate that. that we actually raised the issue. We, we think it's important to study it. We're not ignoring uh, what we heard uh, yesterday. And we need, if, if we do decide to do something differently, we need to understand how it's going to be enforced. Because some of the things that um, I heard are law enforcement issues. They are not KIKA security issues. Now, I would encourage anyone, if they see someone driving one of these recklessly or on a bike path or whatever, call KIKA security, call us. Uh, if you think it's you think it's a life-threatening situation, call 911, obviously. But if we were to move forward with something differently, we really need to understand how we're going to enforce it, who's going to enforce it, how we're going to work with law enforcement on this. Uh, I did see someone made the suggestion a few minutes ago after hearing David's research, well, let's just raise the speed limit to 40, and it's a <laughs> done deal. Um, interestingly, our comment on comments feedback on speeds on Kiowa are about 50 50 too fast too slow um, and so I just don't think it's not my recommendation that we make some change today but I do think that uh, relatively soon we need to compile all of this information uh, and make a decision if there is something we need to do um, differently um, I think that is all I wanted to say in terms of just some opening comments. So we can move on to approval of minutes. Okay. So I have a motion to approve the minutes from July the 2nd, 2018. Right. Second. I have one um, correction. In the last paragraph on the first page, it says Jimmy Bailey put before the board to rein the issue. Should that be to take a name check on?
so I, I would like to go ahead and tackle that one first, unless there's objection. No. <laughs> we have uh, historically on what well, we have evolved um, over the years in the way our annual meetings are conducted uh, back way back before the technology existed for electronic voting the annual meeting was a big event uh, you voted either by showing up or giving your proxy to someone uh, to show up on your behalf back in 2008 i believe the board approved a resolution to allow to streamline the voting process, uh, to begin the process of allowing some electronic voting and some mail voting and so forth. Um, we've evolved even further. Uh, the uh, votenow.com is a third party company that we use to process or handle our elections. They have a, a website that allows you to vote online. You can actually call them uh, to cast a vote over the phone. Uh, and we do still have people that mail votes into them, but all of the processes have made it easier to conduct our election. And the need for proxies for our director elections is when, in fact, um, uh, in the last director election, for in the March election, how many proxies did we have? Zero. Zero. Um, the law in South Carolina changed where if we allow proxy voting, then we also have to allow voting on the day of the meeting, which creates a lot of hassle. Um, we had two people vote in person at the annual meeting this year. And to do that, we set up this huge apparatus of a bunch of staff. We have to certify that the person hasn't already voted. We have to then take the results that have already been tabulated by the third party company, recalculate, and we introduce human error to a process that virtually none of our members are, are taking advantage of. We're, we're, None of our members really are coming and voting in person. And so what we are recommending is that going forward, the board authorize us to, for director elections, uh, when the ballot goes out, someone can vote for any of the candidates. They can vote for a write-in candidate, or they can abstain. Um, but we not have proxies for voting. And what it does is it allows us to have all of the results tabulated in advance. We report those results at the annual meeting and we don't have that whole apparatus set up to accommodate virtually no one who wants to vote in person. And so what we are requesting of the board Today is to amend policy resolution P084, which was approved in 2008, and that's where that's when the board initially approved electronic voting. And all we are saying now is that we're just saying electronic voting may be streamlined. That's the change to to that resolution, um, and uh, then resend policy resolution G152, and this is, I believe, the one that, that Wendy asked about. This really was just a set of standard operating procedures that were approved ahead of the annual meeting last year. They're not, they, they don't really even belong in a, in a resolution. I mean, it just says that the date of record is gonna be X day and we're gonna, um, um, meeting on such and such day and so forth it just um, it, it's it's irrelevant um, and that document it's in the board packet 
Uh, let me just read some of the things that are in that. The meeting will be conducted according to Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, only business of the association shall be conducted. Um, it tells the number of member director positions that are open. Um, it's, it's, it's just procedures for how to run the day. And so um, we believe that it's in everyone's interest, really. And, and frankly, the good point, uh, one, of, one of the directors made a good point to me that we actually have a lot more individual member participation in the election process now than we did back in the days where there were stacks of proxies, that the electronic voting just makes it uh, so much easier for people to participate. And so um, we're, we're recommending um, to amend the 2008 resolution uh, and do away with uh, proxies and day of voting and to rescind the 2015 resolution on the um, uh, procedures for that particular election, which was the last election. And have I covered it, Colleen? You covered it. The only thing I would add is that the G152 resolution um, has been in existence for a few years and it's just been updated every year. So every year we've had to adopt a new resolution to reflect the current year. And that's really not what a resolution is intended to be. The language that exists in that resolution will exist in the um, operating procedure that will be internal to staff. So I'm happy to take any questions at this point. I really like the idea of uh, trying to streamline this so that we don't have um, too many different ways that can impact the total results. And I think you mentioned uh, it makes our annual meeting more reporting out of who was elected as opposed to waiting for that to happen. There's always been that kind of delay while you're counting votes or trying to figure it out. Well, certainly in situations where where the outcome cannot be changed, it's 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 very awkward <laughs> uh, to be sitting there looking at someone you know has lost the election, um, and you know it, and you knew it before a single vote was cast. Um, and so I, I think it makes all the sense in the world. I just want to clarify that members will still have three different ways to vote. They can still use a paper ballot and mail it in. They can vote by phone and they can vote electronically. Yes. Now, our, our objective, will, it, it obviously, is we want more and more people to vote online. It saves money. It's more efficient. Um, you know, people live everywhere, they have multiple residences. So, uh, but yes, I mean, we're, we want to make sure um, that we um, make it as easy as possible. I think last year or the year before was the first year we added the phone in option. I didn't think people would use it, but a few did. And so we want it to be easy for folks to vote. I assume that if after um, we move on this, that we hear or experience issues with it, that we can revisit it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <coughs> uh, I was just going to say, I want to make sure that we are going to be having, and it sounds like we are, so we, you know, clarification on how motions are going to be handled, both the advisory and the non-advisory motions, and sufficient time. I think we've done, uh, we've been increasingly um, improving our technology. I know we, have, we added the, inter uh, the candidate interviews this year, and um, we've been having more of our meetings uh, covered by our technology people, and that some of the things we've built into the Sandcastle, for example, and here have enabled us to do more of that, and we're, we're trying to, um, so I want to urge us to continue to stay on top of that, so we, because obviously by doing as much electronically, we also want a well-informed electric and so that, that's, what, that's all I had to say. Absolutely and, and Kathy's point is dead on. I and mean, it's not like if this we move forward with this and if we conclude that we need to go back, we can go back. I don't think we will. That's that's certainly not what the trend would suggest. Um, but we can always do that. I 
think to me the most important is last year it was zero percent. Uh, I mean, people are not using what was used from the Not many of us have been here as long as I have. <laughs> and I remember the paper stacks. And when do you remember the hose? And it's the only way we had to do it back then. And I, Jimmy, I appreciate you and your staff taking the initiative to try to streamline the process because I do believe this allowed more owners to participate by doing the electronic voting and that. So thank you for thank you and your staff for that. Okay. Uh, my comments would just be that you know it still allows for write ins. Uh, so I think that's all well and good. So we're not changing anything from that standpoint. No. No. So yeah. we need two motions, right? One or two. <coughs> I think you can lock them together unless anyone objects. Any objection to lock them together? Okay. So do I have a motion to uh, amend the policy and uh, rescind the policy resolution? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. What should have been uh, and. <laughs> you didn't make me do that one, did you? I love this game. So you have to go look at the maps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. So, uh, what was number one in new business was to ratify an EVA payroll increases. And um, the board is authorized to vote on things by. Um, uh, in, in between meetings by electronic means, but it's been our practice to report on these things at the next board meeting, and so um, they technically don't have to ratify it. But I'm just, I, I think for the audience, the easiest thing for me to do is just read to you what they voted on. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, and this has to do with payroll, which if you come to these, uh, have been coming to these meetings for a while, you've, you've heard me talk about my concerns on payroll for our hourly employees. Sometime during, the 20, during 2016, Kika's competitive position in the labor market began to slide. Throughout 2017, we experienced much higher turnover than prior years and began to share our concerns with the board about this growing problem. During the budget approval process last year, much of the staff presentation focused on this issue with references to a three-headed monster of low unemployment, a difficult commute, and a high cost of living. Since then, the problem has worsened despite our taking a number of actions to blunt the forces working against us. Unemployment in Charleston County now stands at 2.3%, and I should say that this was written on July 25th. Um, unemployment in Charleston County now stands at 2.3%, the lowest in the state. South Carolina's unemployment rate is 3.8%, slightly below the national rate of 4%. In January of 2017, Kika made the decision to increase its minimum hourly pay to $11.50 an hour. Prior to this change, even if we paid less than regional competitors, we were generally able to fill positions with relatively relative ease, given our benefits package and strong reputation as an employer. Those days have since passed as the Charleston area's cost of living has increased the traffic situation has worsened by the day. In April 2018, the Tri-County area was reported to have had a higher cost of living than the cities of Columbia, Greenville, Asheville, Charlotte, and Atlanta. Based on our current payroll, again, this was written July 25th, 40% of our employees make less than $15 an hour. As of today's date, Kika remains understaffed, particularly in our largest departments of security and land and lakes management. In security, we're currently down two full-time positions. We anticipate another resignation this later this week, so this would drop to three full-time. The quality of applicant we're receiving for these positions is poor. 
They need to pass a drug test and be a law-abiding citizen and able to obtain a SLED license. Despite heavy advertising, the only candidate under consideration at present has a misdemeanor assault and battery charge on their record. We never would have even considered such an applicant in the past, but we're seeing if they can pass a SLED test before completely ruling him out. We are desperate. We did not hire that person, by the way. In Land and Lakes Management, we're down three full-time positions and five seasonal positions. This is tough for Land when they are in the season of the year with, with their heaviest workload. The quality of applicant we are receiving is again poor. In most cases, they will not show for scheduled interview appointments. One re recent week, we had six interviews scheduled and only one person showed up. While we have highlighted these two major departments, we are currently trying to fill 15 positions company-wide with only one person in the pre-employment process. As already mentioned, it's hard to get people to show up for scheduled interviews, and if they do, they often go MIA after learning about the drug test and background check. We have temp agencies looking for us as well, but with limited success, and this is the more expensive avenue. As we have continued to observe around the greater Charleston area, hourly rates are continuing to increase for, an entry, for entry level positions, with Chick-fil-A offering $14 an hour as an example. Closer to home, Seabrook has consistently paid security personnel a higher wage than Kika, and our direct island competitors, Kewa Partners and Kewa Island Golf Resort, Resort are now starting land management equivalent employees at $13 an hour. This morning, one of our own land management employees offered his resignation as he is moving to an on-island competitor. This will drop us to four, down four full-time positions in land management. Instead of starting him at $13 an hour, we're starting him at 14 due to his experience and knowledge of the island. For us, this employee currently makes $11.85 an hour. Our benefit packages are similar, so we cannot fault our employee who has a young family for making this decision to move for an extra $2 an hour. More troubling is the fact that the employee was told there are six additional positions available and to share this information with people he knows. Of course, that news has spread that we have an employee living, leaving for the additional money per hour and is going rapidly through our land and lakes department. Our Land and Lakes Department Security Department cannot handle continuing staff shortages as filling the positions has become very challenging and competitive. We need to hold on to the staff we have for the same reason cited for making an offer to our employee, their experience and island knowledge. We are not in crisis mode yet, but it's in sight. We've done virtually everything possible to enhance our non-cash benefits such as altering our shifts and work hours in an attempt to lessen the number of commute days faced by our employees. We've offered more work from home opportunities, though those are impractical for a majority of our employees. Our benefits package is strong and we have a great culture. At the end of the day, however, we have 40% of our workforce under $15 an hour, and these people are more concerned about putting food on the table than anything else. Our employee engagement survey earlier this year largely validated our belief that people like working here but want to earn more money. We already offer referral bonuses to existing staff for bringing in new hires, have considered retention, and have considered retention bonuses for those who stay for some period of time. At the end of the day, however, people need more money in their paychecks. The board stated in January that one of our key objectives this year is employee retention and attraction. We were scheduled to discuss this at the July meeting, July meeting uh, but delayed it in light of the time crunch of the Sandcastle. We still think it's an important discussion for that meeting, uh, to have that meeting, but believe some action would be immediately necessary. Kika proposes an immediate rate increase to $13 an hour for entry-level employees. Coupled with this rate adjustment to all our hourly employees across grades two through six, in order to hold on to the employees we have, when we have, when we raised starting hourly rates in January of 2017, we did that only at the lowest grades, which created compression to our salary grades. We do not propose to do that in this case, but to raise hourly rates across our grades. 
doing so, this would be a $125,000 to $130,000 increase in payroll costs for the remainder of the year, which of course you double that essentially for a full year. We're not trying to increase them above the starting rates of QO partners and QO offers or to come even with them. It is important for Kiko to retain this experience and talent. Um, appreciate you bearing with me, but it's a I uh, thought that maybe that would be the best way to report on that um, to the community. Uh, and um, I don't remember the tally offhand, but I believe it was a unanimous approval from the board to move forward with that. Any questions? Okay. Um, rules and regulations. Um, Shannon does not get to leave on vacation once we're done with this. <laughs> uh, I, I want to thank Shannon for uh, being the person who really took the deep dive into this document, for consulting our legal counsel along the way. Um, I, first and foremost, I want to um, reiterate why this is here today, and that is the um, state passed a new homeowners association law that requires us to record our rules and regulations, not our covenants, those are obviously recorded, but we have to record our rules and regulations by January or they're unenforceable. It would be a real shame, um, having just gone through the covenant change, to have a bunch of rules and regulations that are unenforceable. And so um, uh, we wanted to go through these um, in some level of detail update them just based on day-to-day uh, -day using them, law changes, etc., and get a copy before the board so that we would get an approved version recorded by the deadline. We can change these rules and regulations as often as we want. If we decide that it will be a vehicle thing next month, we can change them and re-record. But there is some urgency to get a copy recorded. I want to talk just for a second um, about um, the changes that are in here. Most are not substantive, um, but they do consider the daily feedback of our members. I like to say that we have thousands of members on our Eyes and Ears Committee. Um, in fact, all of you are on that committee, and, and we hear from you every day. You can walk into our livability department or security department and I sometimes do this um, and say all right tell me without thinking what's the top thing you're hearing about um, and they hear I mean they, they, they hear a lot uh, and so this reflects some of what we have heard some of what they have experienced over the years in enforcing the rules and regulations um, but again we need to uh, get something recorded, even if it's the old set, that's not what we recommend, but we do need to get some rules and regulations recorded uh, quickly. A uh, few updates that um, I want to call out and then we can discuss really any of it in detail. Uh, there was a rule added to add a restriction um, for contractors uh, bringing animals on the island, um, change to uh, or, or shortening of the period for holiday decor it was Thanksgiving to January 31. That's been shortened to January 15. Um, still a fairly lengthy period. A restriction on the use of drones. I suspect that um, make a question on that but that's in order to maintain uh, member privacy we've, we've had some issues in that regard uh, restrictions on um, heavy duty lifting equipment at construction sites that impede um, traffic um, and then as a direct result of the covenant amendment that was passed uh, in March um, adding some language that deals with um, a violation hearing before the board of directors um, and, and again that, that's a requirement that comes from the, the, the uh, covenant change that was passed um, the board will 
did receive a specific request from a member to consider a change in construction hours for the island. Um, staff did not um, support that recommendation. Um, the, the, the request would ultimately um, shorten construction hours by close to a thousand hours a year. It's pretty expensive to build here already. Um, and um, it would just lengthen the time it takes to build something. And um, you know, speaking personally, I'd, I'd rather have a noisy construction project next to me for a year instead of 18 months. Um, but that was the only one um, where we received a very specific request. Um, but uh, the draft rules and regulations were distributed to the board, I believe, a month ago. It's early on. Um, and so they've, they've been with you for a while. Um, I don't know if your sleep patterns have gotten better. <laughs> uh, but um, certainly, um, probably Shannon, but definitely both of us will um, be happy to answer any questions you have. So I've already provided some questions to Eugene directly. I appreciate you doing this. I wanted to say too, thank you, Lynn, for doing some updates on the language. It's a really hard uh, read in case you didn't already get that. Um, I'd like to see us, even if we pass on this today, I'd like to see us come back to the electric vehicle discussion. And I'd like to suggest that we put together a um, sort of a task force of community members and staff to really look at um, how we would enforce it if we didn't change the rule of having them on the island. What would happen if we did ban them? Those kinds of issues. And report that back to the board um, with some kind of date certain. Uh, I think that this is um, just reading IKEA. It is, uh, to me, several issues. Uh, the speed of it, the safety of it, and the use of them. So I'd like us to really kind of look at that and talk with the provider too. That's one piece that's missing for me. I don't know whether this provider is aware of some of the issues or would care to hear that, but I think somebody on Kika staff should be talking back to that provider uh, who's renting them to people here. Uh, I also uh, would like to see us have a process for getting feedback from the community on these. Uh, it is such scintillating reading, I know. I'm <laughs> sure people would just jump at the chance of it. Um, but I'd like to see us uh, solicit feedback and then have a way for managing what we do with the member, such as in the situation with the work hours. What's our formal response to that, and how does that person know that we considered it, or what the reasons were for saying yes or no to it? Um, and I think the same thing would go with the electric vehicles. We really need to be able to tell the community and we've started that, I think, what what we considered and why the decision was made the way it was. So those are my couple of comments on that. And Kathy, for the woman who made the request on construction hours, I'll send her a letter formally after you all to, to let her know what the discussion was and what she Great. That works. Yes, ma'am. And I just want to say that even though I didn't provide everybody um, board standing stuff. I had a few comments that I did not yet sent to Shannon because it's sitting on my desktop. Um, but the most important is that you can't go to the website and research things like gate access and get a document to come up. So I think that we have to specify anywhere we've mentioned going to the website. We need to specify which, what the site is exactly. Um, and I also suggested maybe at some point we can call out relevant to renters and maybe people have a renter paying so our property owners who rent isn't there a document already oh i don't know i know that the um the rental company you know we talk to the rental companies we're in communication with them but it might be helpful for for us to have something separate so somebody who's renting on another knows what the rules are in terms of um, rental units and so forth i think that's a good idea because we certainly don't want to give them this whole document no. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have kind of a one pager, um, okay. and hopefully, some percentage of them look at it. Um, Ed, my, and our livability director meets with the rental agencies annually, kind of at the beginning of the season. But that's that's something we just have to. 
do over and over and over again. I mean, we get um, for a solid 16 to 20 weeks in a row, we get a new group of people every week that have no clue what the rules are. And so, you know, it's constant. But I think you also ought to involve the owners in knowing, that, you know, making sure they have copies of whatever it is that applies to them. Oh, absolutely. So that they, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of, because ultimately they're, we hold them responsible. Um, so we need a couple of rules to digest. Yeah. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, I'd like to go back to Sue's suggestion about um, searchability. So that, that really uh, that goes back to the ER ongoing discussion about our website. It would yes. be really good to be able to, if somebody has a particular question, they don't have to wade through the document. We might be able to make some structural changes to the document that would make that easier. At some point, um, yeah, maybe yeah. that's something that you can Or some type of Q&A. Yeah, of okay. those okay. ways that could be mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. The main thing that was going to need to be to the website was so that you can search. Yes, well, but <laughs> yes. So in other words, I think yeah, that might come later once we get the whatever we uh, technology we can choices we have on the, on the website, then we can go back in and adapt the document in the best format for making it searchable. But right now, this will yeah, I think this will have to do. I also just wanted to go on record. Uh, in addition to not lap belting people on those carts, um, vehicles, um, I, they're also overloaded. Yeah. So you see teenagers hanging out of the sides and so forth. And so I just want to make sure that's on the record as one of the comments that somebody brought up. The, the overloading of those things is also a hazard. Also, an alcoholic beverage drink, you know, it's behind one, two, three weeks ago in Governor's Drive, which I travel frequently. Teenagers were driving the six passenger with seven or eight kids on it. They're drinking beer. Middle of the day, right out of the hands. They were all drinking. Well, that, that's a great example of um, a situation where law enforcement should be called immediately. Can I make a suggestion on runners? Could we take a look at, or could you take a look at, if anybody has more than three bedrooms, we're uh, requiring them to have two trash cans? Because we have a number of situations on our street, which is becoming more of a rental street. We're on Augusta National. And some of these homes have four or five bedrooms, and one trash can does not. I mean, they scrape for the raccoons and for the animals. <laughs> <laughs>
Kika and Kiowa Partners back in 2000 entered into an agreement um, where Kasik property owners uh, could have the same access to Kiowa as a Kiowa property owner minus the sandcastle. You cannot come and use the sandcastle, but can come um, through the gate like a property owner, get a barcode, etc. And um, Kiko would be compensated um, at a rate by the Kasik HOA of one half of whatever the assessment is here. So the assessment here for an improved house is $2,000. Kasik POA pays Kika $1,000. If an unimproved property here is $1,000, then the Kasik POA pays $500. The arrangement is with the Kasik POA. Um, an individual who happens to own property on Kiowa and in Kasik has made a request not to have to pay the fee associated with the Kasik access agreement uh, because he believes he's only paying for that access by being a member of uh, Kika. Um, staff disagrees with that um, interpretation. Again, we believe that this is an agreement between Kika and the Kasik POA. It's, um, it's, it's a convenience um, for their owners and, um, and, and we would not um, agree to it. A formal request was made to bring it before the board and so it is here with the recommendation from staff to deny the request. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Do you want to go through the reasons that you recommend denying the request? The, the primary reason is that the uh, arrangement is between Kika and the POA, not between Kika and individual Kasik owners. I was just going to make the comment that obviously the person, when they bought lots in two places, knew what the rules were, and they'd been the rules for a long time. So if they didn't want to pay one of those fees, they they should have they bought somewhere else. That's how I feel. If we were to grant this request, it seems to me that, well, first of all, there are other people on the who own two properties, right? And second of all, that anybody who lives on Kiowa and owns multiple properties would only need to pay an assessment for one of those two properties because it's the same thing. If one property gives you all the rights of access, why should you have to pay for the second? Especially if one is undeveloped. So what you're saying is that there are potentially more consequences to this than just this one person's request. That's right. Jimmy, uh, in your information, which you, you talked a little bit about how much money you actually comes <coughs> from, I think it, it would be important to know that. I don't have it right at my fingertips. $90,000 in 2018. About 98,000 comes from all Kasik property owners. Right? From, from, the, from the HL. From, yeah, from the HL. From the HL. HL. I'm a little conflicted on this. I'm on both boards. But <laughs> his, uh, his, his position is, is he, would, um, he believes he's already paying for access to the IOT by paying his KICK assessment to the property owners should have to pay again for an assessment. Understand that this is with the KICA um, agreements with the two property owners association, not individual uh, entities. I know that that's the contract. He was asking for consideration and recognize, I believe they're like 22 
nominating committee for this year, and I'm going to announce their names just in case you don't remember the last time I met. And if you're here, please just stand up and give a wave to the group. Um, so Diana Mosino, Shani Hutchison, Amelia Jenkins, Steve Orlando, and Thomas Roberts. We don't have, as of yet, any candidates who have submitted their applications, which is not unusual, I'm told, for this point in the year. So, still time to get your information <laughs> in. Um, you know, and you might wonder why you want to run for the board. I think um, it's one of those things that, a good opportunity, let's say, to uh, get really involved with your community, to learn things that you probably wouldn't know otherwise. Some good. Most good. Some difficult to hear, um, but really encourage you to get out there. Uh, send in your applications after this meeting today. We're having a brief uh, information session for those of you that might be interested in running for the board to learn a little bit more. I mean, either you send it in or recommend your best friend. <laughs> Send a bottle of champagne with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, now Sam Castle funny. <laughs> um, Jane mentioned that um, you know there's still roughly eight hundred thousand dollars uh, on the contract to help construction. And uh, when this project was approved, or when the funding of the project was approved by the board. Um, funding formula included up to a million and a half dollars in debt. Um, at the last finance committee meeting, uh, there was some discussion about, well, if we're going to borrow this money, maybe we should borrow it from ourselves. We can, we can pay our reserve fund um, at least the same amount in interest that we would pay the bank, um, you know, we're, even though we're in the market, um, we're in the market very conservatively, and you know maybe that would make sense. And so there was some discussion about um, where to borrow the money from. But then um, the the more recent discussion has been um, maybe we shouldn't borrow money at all. Um, we have cash on hand. Um, we, we could pay the balance um, with cash. And not have any debt. Um, the the question you then ask though is, how much do you want to deplete your cash reserves, your operating reserves? And a lot of smart people can come up with different answers to that question. Um, but the good news is, is we have time to um, discuss to think about this. Um, and so the finance committee will have a discussion on that um, at its next meeting um, and we'll come back to the board with a recommendation but it's a good problem to have um, and um, there are there, in my mind there are good arguments for um, for for multiple outcomes um, but that was really the only thing that I wanted to mention on Sandcastle funding update. I do want to um, make a few comments about the project itself. Um, construction of the bathhouse is moving along. If you're there today, the roof and siding shingles are being installed as we speak. The deck around the bathhouse building should wrap up uh, in the next day or two. Plumbing and electrical, and there's not a lot of that, but plumbing and electrical should start by next week. Um, concurrent with that, Boardwalk 8B should start reconstruction next week, and once that happens, it will allow uh, the propane tank to be buried. We've done those $190,000 in sales on temporary propane with Blue Flame coming every couple days to <laughs> fill these um, temporary tanks. Hill tells me it's reasonable to assume um, completion of the bathhouse uh, within a month. On the overall project, um, there are a ton of punch list items still to address. Um, 
given the high level of activity at the same castle, just overall, trying to get open, uh, trying to get this um, back. I mean, we, I feel like we've been operating at 90% all summer, and so um, we hope all of you keep coming, but if a few of your neighbors stay away, we can slow down a little bit. Um, we can jump on some of these um, punch list items. There are a whole, a whole bunch of them that, that we have to address. Uh, one of those um, is uh, there, there are a whole lot of issues to deal with um, with the poolside furniture um, and um, just quite simply the, the decorator who helped us um, has been awesome and has gotten with the suppliers and all of the equipment that has not performed up to the specs. We're getting full refunds on that stuff. But um, it means we have to select new things. We have to coordinate delivery. We don't want there to be a period where we don't have anything at all. Um, but uh, we understand, we've understood since July 3rd that people want more umbrellas. Um, <laughs> um, which we do too, but primarily we want umbrellas that can handle the wind. Uh, we went from 10 to four in about two weeks. Um, uh, despite having a commercial grade uh, umbrella. Uh, and we're, we're looking at ordering additional items uh, that will be part of the 2019 budget request that the, the Finance Committee and Board will be discussing over the next couple of months. As far as usage is concerned, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it's been a record summer. Jane already mentioned the grill. I mean, that's 20% over last year, which was a record. Um, we are um, about 220% over where we were when we introduced a bar at the same castle <laughs> five years ago. Uh, pool use is way up, fitness classes are full, the gym is routinely busy. Uh, we've met a bunch of members who've been on Kiowa for years but have never set foot in that facility until now. Uh, so there's definitely been some of the build it and they will come sort of thing happening um, there. Uh, we are not through looking at the parking lot. Um, I, will, um, I don't know who commented on that. She left. She left. Yeah, she's left. Um, there are a couple things to point out on the parking lot. First of all, um, between temporary dumpster locations, construction laid down, temporary bike parking, and a few other things. We're down about 12 parking spots right now that will open up. Uh, we've not even begun to try to figure out how to manage the double stacked parking for employee parking, but, but that's something that we can think about when we're um, not just trying to keep the doors open uh, every day. And I have, I have asked Tony Elder as he's considering how we deal with new gate access software to look at what options there are for the possibility of a gate system that um, you know doesn't rely on a barcode but also it isn't so simple that it's just a, a keypad where everyone you know within 30 miles knows the code in a week and so uh, I would just say uh, that the issues about parking lot management are still, um, they're, they're, they're still being evaluated. Part of it is we're just not even finished. Um, I will say that I've probably spent more time at the same castle this summer than ever before uh, and have not once not been able to get a spot. However, certainly there have been a lot of days, you know, random Mondays that never would have had more than 20 or 30 cars, where now the lot is 75, 80% full. And so it's something very much on our minds. Uh, as I said, we are um, ready just to start tackling the punch list and finish some things. Getting open was our priority. Um, but there are things that we want to improve on in the off season, both um, mm -hmm. facility and uh, facility-wise and operationally that we just haven't been able to get to. Um, but all of our all of our problems at the San Castle are good problems. Um, it has been really exciting. Uh, I know that the, um, the uh, reintroduction of, of Thursday night 
Denner's has been <coughs> uh, popular. Um, we are um, excited that, that our partnership with Crew looks to be continuing into uh, next year. Um, and we have not had a formal sit down with them to review this year, but all indications are that they are interested and excited to come back. Um, and as evidence of that, they have agreed to keep the bar open on Fridays and Saturdays through October. Uh, do we have the hours? Do we two to eight? Two to eight, Saturday, not Fridays and Saturdays through October. So um, a lot of great things down there that, that we are very excited about. I do, I do want to touch on um, very quickly uh, major repair and replacement. Jimmy, can I just, uh, before you get out of Sandcastle, I, I think the number original budget was 4.5 million, which included 5% potential rate trades, and then now we're at 300 more than that. So 4.8 versus our original plan, or 4.5 million. Right. Approximately. For Hill. No, for the whole project. That was the hill. The hill contract was 4.5. Okay. So that's just a construction. So do you know how much it costs us? Or we it? Approximately. I don't have that in front of me. I know that the board approved um, the initial estimates for, for soft costs were $250,000. I think the board had actually approved three to three hundred and fifty. Um, and then the furniture and fixtures were outside of that. Roughly Five million. Five million. We just produced that for me, and I don't think yeah, it's not uh, having a problem. That is your yeah, okay. uh, On MRNR, um, just want to give a few updates. Uh, Jane mentioned the Terrapin Island Bridge, 50% of it is done. Um, drainage this year so far, we have spent $754,000 on a drainage project, which is roughly 80% of our um, total drainage uh, budget for the year. Uh, you know, we made the decision to just do an allocation for drainage so that we can be more strategic while we're working out there in the field. Um, and as a part of that, we also reduced our contingency for emergencies um, by more than half based on our review of emergencies over the past five years being almost exclusively drainage. Well, just so that I can sometimes say we were right, <laughs> to date no funds have been expended from the contingency for emergency line item in the budget. And I know I probably just cursed it, but um, we have um, a the Inlet Cove Channel, um, an Envirolock bank stabilization project. Um, this is a, um, we've used the Envirolock in several locations uh, around the island. Um, we've received the SURM permit for the Envirolock um, project, but we're still waiting to hear from the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, our engineers' belief is that the Corps was really just waiting for the SURM approval. Um, which we got last week. So hopefully um, we'll be scheduling that very soon, though I can understand why folks would not want to do it until the weather cools off a little bit. Um, 2018 signage has been uh, received and installed. Um, as you may recall, our uh, goal is to replace all of the street signs, all of the regulatory signs around the island uh, in advance of the 2021 PGA. I think we're a little ahead of schedule. Um, trying. Uh, but, but that is done for this year. It included street signage for the East Beach area, as well as beach boardwalk markers and rural signage for keeping the boardwalks in the West Beach uh, area. And planning is underway for 2019. Uh, and a lot of that will uh, be focused on the wayfinding system for our leisure trail signage. Um, Jane did mention in her financial report some um, variances, some positive variances on uh, major repair. Uh, we have made the decision uh, in the last week that 
that uh, we do plan to defer um, any action on road rejuvenation for this year. Uh, we still very much believe in the process, but um, we have been working with the vendor on uh, faster drive, uh, better, first of all, better traffic management, but faster uh, drive time and um, some other things that just did not go as smoothly as, as they should have um, when we first um, moved forward with that. I believe the number was about $300,000. So um, that will not happen this year. So that will be a, a permanent variance for 2018. Uh, our landscape capital improvement, our major project this year was on Governor's Drive from Glossy Ibis to Osprey Point um, Golf Course. Um, it's largely completed with only punch list items remaining. Um, if you drove that for weeks and you saw the what kind of look like eggshells uh, spread out. Uh, that's that's called grass crete. Um, it, it stabilizes the ground so you can plant grass on top of it. Um, this is a kind of a pilot for us. We figure fishermen are going to park there regardless. So let's see if we can do something um, to keep the grass growing. Um, you can look at many of the other um, ponds around the island where people park. Uh, and it's impossible to keep the landscaping um, uh, in, a, in a sort of a finished and um, Kiowa standard condition. And so we are uh, we are hopeful that that's going to be a good solution. Our landscape architect that we use um, has used it before here on Kiowa, um, notably at the entrance to um, Riverview, right down the road. Um, it was, I believe, a fire department requirement to be able to put the arms of the fire truck down. So uh, we're hoping that the grass is going to um, will we'll stay green and healthy there, and that we'll have less breakage of irrigation. Uh, and I think, and I think I've already touched on that. No expenditures from the emergency allowance so far this year. Any questions on MR and R? Last thing on my list is I just wanted to give an update on our community engagement. Um, I'd like to talk, um, first of all, just kind of give a refresher on the, the purpose of those sessions. Um, back in January when the board had its retreat, it looked at the current strategic plan and um, reviewed it and felt like, you know, hey, it, it still seems pretty relevant. Most of the things in here still make sense. Um, maybe there's some uh, additions or deletions, but by and large, the document looks pretty good. However, before we take any deep dive into um, the strategic plan or make any assumptions about um, it, it being sort of the ongoing document, let's let's figure out how to have a community engagement process on some really high level topics. And so um, we hired uh, uh, David McNair of the McNair Group. Um, he's really one of the best facilitators I've ever um, been around uh, to uh, facilitate three community engagement sessions that will then be followed up by a survey um, that, that the McNair Group does. Uh, the first session was held a few weeks ago. Um, the feedback that we received from people who attended that session said, uh, felt that it was it was a high quality uh, session, that it was informative, um, that they really felt like they got to engage and provide feedback. One of the really great things that David does is he allows everyone in the room to instantly respond to questions through their smartphone that he puts on the screen. And so, you know, what, what happens is um, you, you really get a true sense of what the people in the room are thinking as opposed to, you know, one or two people who might be more comfortable jumping up in front of a, a microphone. You, you, you get to hear from everyone and it helps 
helps guide the conversation. Um, the other great thing um, is that uh, we are going to be able to extend that technology at the next session to people who are participating online. So if you're sitting in New York or Pittsburgh or London and you want to get on the live stream, which we will offer, you will also be able to sit on your smartphone and answer the questions that he is asking. Um, so um, we're very excited about that. Um, and um, again, we felt like the feedback from the people who attended was very, very positive. Uh, the next session is October 8th. Um, it's an evening session. Uh, we, we, we have tried everything possible within reason to um, provide as much access to these sessions as possible by spreading them out on the calendar, having one evening, a couple during the day, and now this um, option to participate uh, remotely. Uh, and then finally the last session, I don't have the exact date in front of me, but it, it's in November. So uh, three great opportunities for the community to engage on sort of high level um, strategic type issues um, facing the community now into the future. Uh, so a lot of great things happening in the life of the community um, and, um, uh, and more to come. I think you mentioned that after these three group sessions, the relevant subjects, I think David's plan is to ask the entire 100% of the population to get everybody's feedback as to what they think, where Kika is and where Kika should be going. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> and that's my report. Thank you, Jim. Board member comments? No further comments. I have a couple of things. Um, first of all, I just wanted to reiterate that it would be helpful when we have our meetings to have the agenda and the supporting documentation online. Good way for people to be able to participate and know what we're going to talk about ahead of time. Does it have to be the right document? <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy mentioned the Sea Level Rise Committee. I had the opportunity to attend several of the meetings and was just totally impressed with the um, way in which they approached a very difficult and complicated um, sort of topic and kind of condensed it down into um, points that make sense to even if you're not a you know naturalist, biologist, uh, you know person that you can really understand at the uh, town council meeting yesterday there was a uh, brief PowerPoint presentation which I'd like us to get a hold of if we could because it might really help the board um, as they're reading through the report how to get focused on it. Um, one of the key points for me on this type of uh, report is our discussion back in January as a board when we were looking at our strategic plan and I do think that some of the concepts or things that we need to do or have underway really uh, need to be integrated into that strategic plan. I believe we talked about that and just had an operation last year. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. I believe that concludes our meeting for September the 5th, 2018. Remember, comments. I mean, if I need to do a 38 market tonight. Uh, first of all, I have one follow up. Excuse me, hold on. We got a member of comments. Sorry. I want to follow up on Kathy's comments about the Sea Level Rise Committee because I attended, I think everyone but one meeting. The people who served on that committee, in addition to having experience, education, and knowledge, pertinent to the topic, put in a ton of work. The report was incredibly impressive. He could easily have been a chicken little, chicken little, the sky is falling report because there's plenty to scare us <coughs> about what's going to happen. But that's not what it became. It really, because if you go through it, you see, okay, so there are these X number of things that could just 
force you to say, why do I even have property here? It's going to be underwater. Let me just get out. Provides follow-up reading and information about what can we do proactively to prevent the worst things that could be possible from happening. And I think that's a very important um, piece of the work that the committee did. Um, I have to sh thank Shannon publicly. I thank her privately. I had probably the worst experience I've ever had driving on the island, probably about eight weeks ago, where I was, uh, I had taken my foot off the brake to make a left turn from Governor's on to, to go past the gate, and somebody came flying down from Red's Bluff. I mean, I was shaking. And I got the, um, a description of the car and the license tag, and Shannon followed up, and Tony followed up, and I just really, really appreciate it, because it was clearly somebody who obviously was very important and had to get somewhere, but I mean, it was a really dangerous situation, and I really appreciate it, um, what Shannon did. I want to follow up whichever one of you mentioned about the possibility of Thursday night dinners, because the dinners that crew provided at the Sandcastle Procedure were fabulous and I heard so many people when we were there saying you might have to do it once a month and, and you let people know what the night is going to be so that if it's somebody who isn't here full time but they know three weeks hence there's going to be a Thursday night dinner I can be there for it it would be fabulous because you meet people with those things you would not otherwise um, normally meet um, in addition to, obviously, agreeing with Kathy's comments about things being online, people do go and read the minutes when they're posted after they've been approved. And my suggestion would be not to just say CTRs are in line with budget. Put the numbers there, because they're impressive numbers. You just say, well, higher, but they're impressive numbers, um, nevertheless. And I certainly don't have the answer to this, but Townsend was talking about um, annual meetings many, many years ago. I mean, when we first moved here, we had about 400 people who lived on the island full time, and you would get in excess of 1,000 people at every annual meeting. And it was a social event as well as um, a way of conducting association business. Now, there are lots of positive things say about the way technology has helped things. But what that ends up doing is people say, well, why should I bother even going? So if there's some way that somebody a lot smarter than I can come up with an idea to get people coming back. And I just want to make another pitch. We talked about a committee to look at the whole issue with these um, vehicles that can cause problems on the street committees because it's not only getting property owner input but you get people who might otherwise have never thought about serving on the Kika board but they see well I served on this committee and we were able to accomplish X, Y, and Z maybe I will work for the board. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Uh, Jimmy, one comment you made when you were talking about the slow speed vehicles was the environmentally friendly vehicles. The advertising by the big renter here is they're really pushing, oh, we have gasoline ones okay, because of the electric problem. And they don't have uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the emission systems, etc. And they also have on there, if you don't have that cot full of gas, they charge you to either fifty or hundred dollar fee, and if it's not fully charged when you leave, mm -hmm. give it back. It's one hundred twenty. I think it's one hundred twenty five dollar fine. So where are they going to plug all these in? If they're ready condos, I can see now fifty foot extension cords plugging them in, and people are renting their houses. What, what's going on? You know, people are renting. They're going to be plugging them in every night. They're going to see a three hundred dollar electric bill. So that that's a, they're not environmentally friendly. Uh, what other uh, two other uh, things that I want to mention? At the front gate, there's one little sign that says get in the left lane. I know this has been a thing that did not go up. I came back 
leaving the airport. Uh, I was in Rhode Island last week. I'm back at 10 o'clock. Both cops in front of me were there forever because they didn't have a pass and they haven't had the conversation. They need, particularly in a rental season, better signage over there to keep them in the left lane. 50% of the time I'm at that gate, somebody's going to stop. Hold on. Are you saying we do stop people at the gate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, yeah, I got this, this is the sign that I saw relevant then. There was somebody in front of me one day, and he's arguing with the person. It's on and on and on and on, and she finally threw up the hands go. He didn't have a pass. So anyway. Uh, bike paths, and, and, and I mentioned the front gate signs. Bike paths, Everybody with the 10 speed, the business is out of the helmet, thinks they can go down governor's drive and keep riding the drive. That's a problem. There's no enforcement for that whatsoever. But when you get to Surf Song and Flyway, where there's no bike paths, there's a lot of traffic and bike traffic on those roads. Four abreast, five abreast, both sides of the road. I think it would be appropriate. Yeah, we won't like it. Just put that, like on every other street in the world with their bike paths, just put the white line with a little bike symbol there. Maybe they think about staying on one side of the road or staying in a single file. Because you come on some of these roads, I was there the other day, with 10 people abreast on flyway. And I'm coming behind them. If you took, you know what they do. So you rev the engine a little bit so they can hear you. And then they look at you like you're crazy. You know, then they, they go back single file and then you're right back again. And that's that's my one of my pet <laughs> One of the changes in the rules manual is that on streets where there's no white cap, there's a white cap. Not that people will pay it, but it is. Well, I think the white cap will do it. I have a question. You briefly mentioned that the, what, the privately held, I believe, water um, company that now owns the water and sewer assets here on Kiowa that used to be the development partners with assets. We're talking about yet another rate increase. Do they not have to go through the regulatory yes. process just like a public utility? They do. They, they do. do. So <laughs> eventually they do. Yeah, they all are public utility. That concerns me just because having moved here from Atlanta, I was on the DeKalb County Water and Sewer Citizen Advisory Board for a year, appointed by commissioner in my district and I've had tons of experience dealing with water and sewer issues uh, at the residential level. Yeah, they, they came and just paid a courtesy call to say that this was coming and, um, and I invited them whenever they have their information to come to the board and give a presentation that the community can listen to. Um, but they still have to go through that process. process. Now they 25%? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they're talking five or six, but we'll, we will, that's why they're being invited to, when, when they have their information, they'll come and share it. One comment, I thought water was expensive here. I was in Monterey, California recently. There was a big to-do, signs all over the place about water. The average water bill for a single family home in Monterey without irrigation is five hundred six dollars a month. Bill Proctor, Augusta National. Quite a few people know me. Uh, I have a couple questions. First of all, we've been here 34 years, so it might as well as some people, I guess. But uh, no, nope, that's you, you beat me. Okay. Uh, one of the questions I have the roads, even though they're you're going to be uh, furthest, I think the roads are getting in pretty bad shape every 34 years. Or, we need to make some adjustments to some of the side roads. If you take a look at that, I appreciate it. Just, uh, I know it's easy for me to be from one road, but our roads have been repaired and repaired, and I kept shoveling dirt into one section because the whole, I thought we were going to lose the tire. Um, the other thing is, on uh, Governors and Surf Song and some of the other places, you don't, you can't see the bikers coming. And that's become an issue. And we're talking about a, a 10-speed bike I mean, I've, I've been here a long time, and I was driving out the other day, you know, well, last week, and somebody went flying by without stopping on the sign, and that's as close as I've ever come to hitting a biker. I mean, that's why I was, it was within a couple of feet when I hit the brakes. So, I don't know, at least I'd like to be able to see them if we're going down that road. That's important to us. Um, the, uh, and it's not just that. I mean, you can drive around. If you drive a car, it's, I know some of the guys who drive around in their pickup trucks and they can see a lot better. But if they get back down to the, the size of the car, it's a, it's a little 
what's up. Um, I do, I, I think the Sandcastle is fantastic, but I come out of retailing, those are not commercial umbrellas, they're not commercial stands, those are residential umbrellas, those are residential stands, and I can give you enough information to prove that. But as long as they're being replaced, that's fine. But those were not commercial. And some of the other things I can say about that, but I just wanted you to be aware that they were not for your own Thank you. Anyone else? No. Thank you, everybody, for coming.